Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are in the world. Um, I'm Elliot Block, um, Research Director and Tech Service Director at Arm and Hammer Animal Nutrition, uh, Animal Food Production. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Greg, Dr. Greg Penner today uh, to give his uh, his conference on the consequences of our feed events in cattle. Before we start, I want to make sure everybody understands that we're recording this. Um, you are all muted, and but you will be pretty soon to be opening up a uh, a box that will allow you to ask questions. I'll see all the questions, and if uh, if it's appropriate at the timing we'll, we'll stop and ask the questions during the presentation but most of the questions will hold to the end and i will uh, anonymously uh, ask greg the questions that you've posed so dr greg penner um, greg received his bachelor's and master's university of saskatchewan and his phd from university of alberta 2009 he joined as assistant professor in the Department of Animal and Poultry Science at the University of Saskatchewan in a teaching and research role. He currently holds the Centennial Enhancement Chair in Rumen Physiology, Ruminative Physiology at the university. He's had several awards over the years. Uh, 2012, the Canadian uh, Society of Animal Science Young Scientist Award. Uh, University of Saskatchewan Teaching and Advising Award in 2013, and in 2017, he had double honors as the um, National Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada Fellowship uh, and the Early Career Research Award from the American Society of Animal Science. He's listed as author or co-author on about 98 scientific publications. Uh, journal articles, mainly but not solely fo focusing on gastrointestinal function, rumen physiology, uh, and absorption. Uh, he also has been dabbling in some rumen microbial diversity. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Greg, and uh, we'll let it rock and roll. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I want to put the context of this presentation uh, out right as we go, and, and the title is uh, Off Feed Events in Cattle, and I want to be very clear that this is quite different than uh, programmed limit-fed programs. Uh, so we're really talking about transient events that cause cattle to have a pretty marked reduction in feed intake, and I'll get into some studies that really look at how severe of a reduction uh, that needs to be for it to induce some of these effects uh, on the gastrointestinal tract and potentially for uh, cattle performance. A lot of the data that I'm going to show is, is fairly basic in nature. It's really designed to evaluate proof of concept. They've been fairly short-term studies. And so at this point, we don't have a lot of production data to link uh, these outcomes back to. But I think the applied relevance is, is pretty straightforward. And so we can discuss that and I'll try to highlight that uh, as we move through the presentation. So really the focus of this is on understanding how the gastrointestinal tract responds to a variety of uh, management procedures, whether they be intended or uh, unintended and simply consequences of the environment or other conditions where those cattle are, are housed. And so if we think back in terms of the core functions of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, as, as we went through our, our schooling, we were probably taught uh, that the gastrointestinal tract serves an absorptive and secretory function. And this really differs, or these functions differ based on where in the gastrointestinal tract we're focusing. So if we focus on, on the rumen, really looking at feed digestion, regulation of ruminal pH, uh, certainly nutrient absorption with the absorption of short chain fatty acids, as well as quite a few minerals, uh, and then the ability to secrete urea uh, 
back into that rumen to uh, help facilitate uh, available nitrogen for those microbes. Now, obviously, I've focused on what's happening in the rumen, but we know that uh, some of those processes also occur more distally in the gastrointestinal tract. So that was the focus for, for quite a few years, and I, I would argue that a more recent focus is looking at aspects that are related to gut health and communication between the microbes and the host serves a, a critical component here as the microbes are sending signals that could induce an immune response, and that links back to the barrier function as well. So when we focus on barrier function, we're really looking at the ability of the gut to maintain components uh, outside of the body, okay? So if we think of that gastrointestinal tract as a modified tube that extends from the mouth to the anus, really everything inside the lumen of that gastrointestinal tract is still outside of the animal. And so that barrier function refers to the ability to keep non-desired molecules outside of the animal while allowing for permeability or movement of desired compounds across that gastrointestinal tract. So it really focuses on the ability to regulate movement of compounds between cells while still allowing for absorption of compounds through cells. Okay, and this is really critical when we think about the rumen, but also the, the hindgut, considering the very high microbial density, the potential for pathogens, and the other components of bacteria or other microbes that could induce a pro-inflammatory response through antigen interaction or translocation. Okay, the other area, as I already alluded to, is really the communicative function. So there's been a lot of work starting to explore how the microbes and the host are communicating and really who is controlling or dictating that, that communication. We also know there is a lot of nutrient sensing. So this could be nutrients coming from the diet or it could be compounds coming from the microbial community. And probably the best example of this would be butyrate a very clear microbial product that has very strong biological impacts on the gut as well as uh, on the host itself. So we have all of these functions that are required. And if we are really considering gut health, we're trying to promote management of cattle and feeding of cattle in a way that optimizes that absorptive and digestive function, maintains that selective barrier, and allows them to communicate in a regular, regulated process uh, between the host and the microbes. So let's narrow in a little bit more on barrier function, and I, I'm not gonna go into the direct mechanisms, but I think it's really important to highlight some of the key aspects that we're gonna be talking about later in the presentation. So what you see at the top of the slide here is cells, and these would be enterocytes, so these are cells that line the intestine, and you can see that these cells are arranged in uh, a single cell uh, structure, so it's one cell separating the lumen, the digesta, from the blood, shown as the basement membrane, and to help maintain these cells in a side-to-side -side orientation, there are uh, intra uh, sorry, extracellular proteins that help adhere those cells to one another. And there are different levels of these proteins that are uh, helping to adhere these cells. So we can have tight cell junctions, which are located most closely to the digesta. Common tight cell junctions you're going to hear uh, in the presentation would be occludins or zona occludins. Uh, and I'll show you some gene expression data for how those might be affected by off-feed events. Once you go a little deeper into that cell, into in the diagram more the mid-region, mid we can see desmosomes, so another form of proteins that really anchor those two cells uh, together. And then finally, as we go closer to that basement mes membrane, we see gap, ju gap junctions, which allow for some uh, cell-to-cell -cell communication. So if an outcome uh, 
or an antigen is affecting a given cell, there can be chemical messengers sent between these gap junctions to help uh, inform the adjacent cells that there is a, a pending challenge. Now, we often think about tight cell junctions as being one of the primary indicators uh, for a healthy gut or if we see down regulation for a leaky gut, but we need to think more broadly and recognize that in some cases, our management procedures can be quite drastic. So the image to the right, uh, as gruesome as it is, is the inside of a rumen from an animal that was rapidly adapted and obviously too rapidly adapted to a very highly fermentable diet. So you can see what would appear to be normal papillae lining the inside of the rumen uh, where the cursor is pointing. You can see an area where those papillae have been eroded off. So we essentially have a region of the rumen now that has a diminished surface area available. And then we have areas where there are active necrotic lesions. So in this case, where we have complete destruction of that epithelium, barrier function really is completely compromised and we do not need to consider tight cell junctions because those microbes and end products from fermentation have direct access to uh, arterial uh, circulation. We really think that this is the primary cause for liver abscesses. And while we often think of liver abscesses in relation to feedlot cattle, we know dairy cattle, uh, cull dairy cattle, have a very high proportion uh, of liver abscesses. So this likely is occurring also uh, in our uh, lactating dairy cattle. Now, how the gastrointestinal tract maintains that barrier function differs based on the region uh, that you're looking at. So on the left side, you can see a cartoon diagram of what the rumen epithelium would look like. And you can compare and contrast that to what the intestinal epithelium would look like on the right-hand side. So the first thing you should notice is that when you look at the rumen, there are multiple cell layers. So those are strata. And within those strata, those cells, as they mature and grow from the basement membrane out to the uh, lumen, they adapt and they uh, mature and change their function. So the basal membrane cells are really those metabolically active cells that are metabolizing those uh, volatile fatty acids. And when you look at the outermost cells, this is really where most of the protective barrier is formed. So cells within the stratum corneum are highly keratinized, just like your skin allowing for protection of abrasive forces coming from that physically effective NDF or the scarification factor within the roughages in the diet. In the stratum granulosum and spinosum, this is where the bulk majority of the tight cell junctions are. So this is more that uh, protein mechanical barrier helping to adhere cells to one another. And we should also realize that that rumen epithelium really has no secretory function, meaning that it is not secreting mucus. So it is not a mucus membrane. It is protecting the underlying layers through that keratinized cell uh, layer or strata, and then through those tight cell junctions that are lying underneath. You compare that to the intestine, and now we're dealing with a mucus membrane with a quite prominent mucus secretion. Two different mucus layers can be identified, a more dense mucus layer, which is uh, smaller and closer to the epithelium, and a more diffuse mucus layer, which is larger, but obviously uh, has a further association to that epithelial membrane. What this does is provides a direct barrier for microbial colonization, and within these uh, mucus secretions can also be secretion of any microbial properties or any microbial peptides that further uh, have a inhibitory effect on that microbial colonization, hoping to protect that underlying epithelia from those microbial inhabitants. So we see very different structures of the gastrointestinal tract, and because of those changes in structures, they have different different approaches in terms of protecting the underlying layers from um, non-selective permeability.
So we started this road looking at kind of the gut health side uh, quite a few years ago, and this was one of the uh, preliminary studies we did. In this study, we were really looking at how weaning management programs uh, may affect gastrointestinal tract integrity. Very simple experiment, 14 newborn Holstein bull calves. We either weaned them uh, starting, uh, or sorry, weaned them on day 42 after a seven day step down period. So that milk allowance was decreased starting on day 35, or we had a, a control treatment, which we simply did not wean. So when you look at the response, it's, it's pretty clear, just characterizing our treatments. You can see as calves uh, uh, grew uh, in age or, or got older, they received more milk replacer. During week six, we started that uh, step down weaning phase. And so you can see that our wean treatment was decreasing uh, their milk replacer intake. In contrast to the milk replacer intake, or when we dropped it, just as we would expect, starter intake went up. And I'll, I'll be the first to acknowledge our starter intake is probably a little bit lower than would be desirable in this study. However, if you use a timed weaning approach, this could be a realistic outcome. And in response to that market change in diet, that reduction in milk replacer intake and market increase in starter intake, we wanted to assess whether total gastrointestinal tract permeability was affected. So this is a, a procedure that we modified from some monogastric studies where they've used chromium EDTA, so a covalently linked chromium molecule, uh, as an indicator of barrier function. The principle is pretty sim simple. Chromium EDTA is fairly large. And chromium EDTA as a complex is not absorbed across the gastrointestinal tract. So it is not absorbed through those cells. However, we know that when we measure chromium EDTA in feces, we only get about 95, 96% recovery. So 4 to 5% of that chromium EDTA has disappeared somewhere else. And if you look back at even the very old literature, it was clearly shown that it comes out in the urine. Well, how can the chromium EDTA get in the urine if it's not absorbed? Well, it can cross between cells. So relating back to that integrity of those tight cell junctions, crossing through those tight cell junctions, and then it's excreted by the kidneys. So how we would interpret this data is that if we have higher chromium EDTA release in urine, we would make the assumption that that gastrointestinal tract is more permeable. And indeed, we did see changes in permeability. We had a very nice treatment by time interaction in this study where those calves that were not weaned, shown in the black bars, had a continual decline in terms of their uh, tight cell, or sort of their permeability. So that gut became more tight less leaky as that calf aged. But what we clearly saw was as those calves were weaned, shown here in week six with the white bar, we completely disrupted that process. So a very aggressive weaning coupled with probably too low of starter intake may have induced a leaky gut situation in those calves. So we thought this was uh, pretty interesting and we were looking at other factors that might be affecting uh, total tract permeability or, or gut health in cattle. And we started down the path of factors that influence feed intake. So what I want to highlight here is that there are a number of factors that might cause a very transient but quite marked reduction in feed intake. I'm not going to show any heat stress data, but obviously heat stress would be one of the primary causes that would induce a pretty marked and transient reduction in feed intake. Transition disorders like metritis or mastitis, displaced abomasum or hypocalcemia all also cause a very large reduction in dry matter intake. And even uh, respiratory diseases like uh, BVD cause a very marked and short-term reduction in feed intake. This is uh, the transition side. 
this is some pretty old data, but if you look at this uh, one study example, we saw about a 30% reduction in dry matter intake as prima paris cows approach parturition. And that lines up very well with the literature where cattle on average drop dry matter intake by about 30% uh, as parturition approaches. And most of that reduction, almost 90% of that occurs in the last week of calving. So if we think about, about off-feed events, really what this data is suggesting is that our transition dairy cattle are going through uh, about a 30% reduction in dry matter intake, and the duration of that exposure is about one week in, dur in duration. If we compare this to some feedlot data, so this would be the expected dry matter intakes for newly arrived feedlot cattle, and I would expect this would also mirror or at least partially represent uh, heifer ranches if heifers are transported uh, quite a significant uh, distance. So for these newly received feedlot cattle, we can see intakes that are expected of about half a percent of body weight up to 1.5% of body weight. And that duration of exposure is more extended, uh, ranging between two and three weeks uh, of time before those cattle are actually eating the amount of dry matter that we would anticipate they would uh, consume. Now, until we started this research, there was really no data understanding or evaluating how gastrointestinal tract is function is affected by exposure to low feed intake. However, there was some work done uh, in Germany evaluating the exposure to complete feed withdrawal. So in this study, they used lambs and they exposed them to 48 hours of uh, complete feed withdrawal, and they evaluated how short-chain fatty acid absorption or VFA absorption differs from animals not exposed and animals exposed. And they showed that with 48 hours of feed withdrawal, we can see reductions in absorptive capacity of the rumen by approximately 50%. So even though a short duration of exposure, very marked reductions in the ability of those animals to absorb short-chain fatty acids. So this has very large implications in terms of regulation of rumen pH and probably more importantly, nutrient delivery to those animals. So to follow up that study, we conducted an experiment to evaluate how severity of low feed intake events or off feed events influence gastrointestinal tract function. Our treatments in this case evaluated exposure to 75% of their voluntary feed intake, 50% or 25%. So trying to cover a wide range of uh, low feed intake exposure covering hopefully what we would see under commercial situations. We expose these uh, treatments in one of five periods. So first we had a baseline measurement period where we measured their voluntary feed intake. Then we exposed them to their treatment of varying severity of feed restriction, and then gave them the same diet and allowed them three weeks of recovery. Now, the reason for this is first, we wanted to understand what is the impact of that low feed intake event? So what is the impact of feed restriction? And again, this would be a transient off feed event. And then finally, for those cattle that go through that off feed event, what does the recovery phase look like? Hopefully our cattle are recovering after being exposed to uh, these nutritional challenges or heat stress or uh, diseases, and how can we better improve our understanding of that recovery response. All of the cattle in this study were fed the same diet. This is uh, what I would call a pretty safe diet, 60% forage, half of that being a grass alfalfa hay, the rest of it basically being barley grain. Uh, but when I look at least the nutrient composition, there's nothing really to be too concerned about uh, for non-pregnant uh, heifers. So getting into the results, uh, this is again just characterizing our model. Uh, you can see feed intake did not differ during the baseline period, and then we did achieve our exposures as intended, being 75, 50, and 25% of their voluntary dry matter intake. 
not surprising when you decrease dry matter intake, we decrease the short chain fatty acid or volatile fatty acid concentration in the rumen and that happened in a dose dependent manner. So the greater the reduction in feed intake, the greater reduction in fermentable carbohydrate intake and consequently a greater reduction in short chain fatty acid concentration in the rumen. When short chain fatty acid concentrations decrease, mean pH generally goes up and we found that response and again, a nice dose-dependent response where those animals that went through a greater reduction in feed intake had higher mean pH than those that were still eating more. Now, I think this is really important to consider not only for the sake of, of uh, off-feed events, but also for the sake of people that are interested in using rumen pH as an indicator for efficient rumen function. Often we get caught in the trap where high pH would be assumed to be better. I would argue high pH is only better if we can standardize dry matter intake. And so often we see high pH simply because animals are not eating sufficient amounts uh, of dry matter. Looking at the same data another way, in this case, just looking at the amount of time that pH is below 5.5 uh, is a, a threshold perhaps indicating rumen acidosis. We can see that when cattle were exposed to that feed restriction period, uh, we really avoided any exposure to low pH. So we used a technique uh, called the temporary isolated uh, washed reticular rumen technique. And this is an approach where we evacuate the rumen, we wash the rumen contents out, we occlude the esophagus, occlude the omasolosis, and then we introduce a buffer to the rumen so that we can measure disappearance of the compounds in the buffer to indicate absorption. So we did this to measure short chain fatty acid absorption. And you can see that imposing feed restriction caused a tendency for a reduction in short chain fatty acid absorption or VFA absorption across that reticular rumen. Now, I'm going to be a little bit uh, liberal with these results, and while it is a tendency, I'm going to make the claim that this is actually uh, an important biological reduction. And I'll provide some further evidence of that in a couple slides, uh, because we have another study which really used the same model, and we did detect a significant reduction. So two separate studies, both showing the same trend. I'm going to argue that this is biologically relevant. We also found there was a tendency for a dose response. So the more severe that feed restriction event was, the greater the reduction in short chain fatty acid absorption. So we need to put this in context, or I, I like to put this in context because these animals that were exposed to 25 or 50% of their voluntary feed intake obviously have a lower nutrient intake, but coupled with that lower nutrient intake, they have decreased capability to absorb those nutrients that are digested, okay? And so this is kind of a, a double-edged uh, problem where not only are they dropping intake, but they're uh, also dropping their absorptive capacity. So this is that other study I was talking about. In this case, we tried to compare the response when cattle were fed a high forage diet or a moderate forage diet. We imposed that feed restriction. And while there was no effect of diet, we did show that imposing that feed restriction did again reduce short chain fatty acid absorption across the rumen. So proving the concept that uh, low feed intake or a transient exposure to low feed intake and off feed event uh, can decrease the capacity for cattle to absorb nutrients across that rumen. We also evaluated barrier function in, in the study I showed you with 75, 50, or 25% uh, low feed intake. And in this case, what we saw was those animals that were exposed to quite severe feed restriction, 25% of their voluntary dry matter intake, they continued to have, uh, or sorry, they did have elevated urinary chromium EDTA excretion suggesting that that exposure to low feed intake compromised barrier function of the gastrointestinal tract. 
So really what we interpreted this data to suggest is while not as severe as would be for complete feed withdrawal, we can see a dose response for low feed intake causing a reduction in nutrient absorption across the rumen, short-chain fatty acids uh, in this case, and increased potential for total tract permeability. We also wanted to understand how those animals respond uh, once they are going through the recovery effect. So again, you see the feed restriction data here uh, with the cursor, and we're looking at three consecutive weeks of recovery. Again, these animals were fed the same diet. So you can see during recovery one, we have the lowest dry matter intake, and you can still see a clear treatment effect where those animals are restricted to the greatest amount, had the lowest dry matter intake, intermediate for 50%, and at least numerically greatest for those restricted to 75% of their voluntary intake. We did see a treatment by time interaction suggesting that those more severely restricted animals took a longer amount of time to recover even their basal dry matter intake in the absence of a diet change. Now, I want to remind you that those animals restricted to 50 and 25% of their dry matter intake uh, during the challenge period had the lowest intake during week one of recovery and those animals also had the lowest mean pH. So we're showing here, or we found in this experiment, that if we want to cause a high risk for low pH, exposing those animals to low feed intake immediately prior was a very effective strategy. And in fact, this is used commonly in acidosis induction strategies, where we will restrict feed intake for a fairly short period of time coupled by the provision of their regular diet. Now, in this case, we need to recognize that that low pH was not caused by binge feeding, simply because those animals still had the lowest dry matter intake. And in fact, when we look again at the duration of exposure below 5.5 as an indicator for rumen acidosis, we can see despite the lowest dry matter intake during week one, those cattle had the greatest exposure to ruminal acidosis with about six hours below uh, pH 5.5. So this would be a threshold that we would consider uh, to be uh, exposure to rumen acidosis. Now, we're not the only ones to show this. This is a recent experiment uh, published in uh, Animal. And in this experiment, they exposed cattle to either 12, 24, or 36 hours uh, of no feed intake, so short-term feed withdrawal. And they showed that, as I showed in the blue line here, upon refeeding, you can see that those animals had a greater reduction and a greater area that pH was below uh, 5.8 in this case. You can see the same response for uh, 24 hours of complete feed withdrawal, and the response for 36 hours of feed withdrawal is even more prominent. So while in a dairy situation, we wouldn't expect to see such prolonged experience uh, periods of complete feed withdrawal, what I think this data is highlighting is that even short-term periods with no access to feed, so an empty bunk or overstocking, uh, certainly could increase the risk for low rumen pH. Going back to our study, we were looking at why those cattle might have low rumen pH, and given the relationship between VFA absorption and rumen pH, we speculated that it might be because those animals restricted to a greater extent had lower absorption of short-chain fatty acids, and indeed that's what we saw, where those animals restricted to a greater extent had lower absorption of the VFA during the feed restriction period, that persisted throughout the first week of recovery, uh, but was basically corrected by three weeks after that feed restriction event. So we think that the exposure to that low feed intake causing a greater reduction in short-chain fatty acid absorption was probably the driving mechanism for why uh, cattle seem to be at risk for rumen acidosis. Now, looking at the barrier function response, it was a bit surprising to me, but we still detected uh, 
somewhat of a leaky gut situation in those cattle that were restricted to the greatest severity. So those animals restricted to 25% had greater chromium uh, excretion in urine than restricted to 50%, although that 75% uh, were not different. So this is suggesting that there may be some more longer term consequences of low feed intake uh, on total tract permeability. Now we, we also evaluated in another study some strategies to affect that recovery response, hoping that we could accelerate it. One of the ways we looked at that was by comparing a high forage diet to a moderate forage diet. In this case, that moderate forage diet was 60% forage, just like I showed you. The high forage diet was essentially 82%, or sorry, 92% forage. What you can clearly see is that those animals fed the high forage diet, resumed their dry matter intake within the first week of recovery, whereas those animals fed that moderate forage diet required still that three week time frame to return to basal levels after a period of feed restriction. When we look at the rumen acidosis response, again, using pH 5.5 as a threshold, those animals that we transitioned using a moderate fermentable diet uh, or moderate forage diet had again induced rumen acidosis despite having lower dry matter intake. Those animals with a high forage diet uh, essentially were protected. So I think about this from transition cow strategies or sick cattle strategies, and I think what it is suggesting is we need to think about how we can use the dietary forage proportion, probably on a very short-term basis, to help stabilize rumen fermentation patterns prior to a rapid grain or rapid diet adaptation to make sure we are meeting the metabolizable energy and metabolizable protein needs for those cattle. Now, the data I've been showing to date has really looked at total tract uh, permeability and has not separated where those barrier dysfunctions might occur. Now, I also highlighted at the start of the talk that how the rumen is organized and how it maintains its barrier function is quite different than what occurs in the small and the large intestine. So we ran a study to evaluate in the absence of challenge in healthy tissues, how do those different regions uh, differ in terms of their ability to restrict movement of molecules that we use as indicators for permeability. So in this case, we're using mannitol as our indicator. Mannitol is really a hydrophilic marker, but it's commonly used as a paracellular permeability marker. So this would be a compound that does not get absorbed through cells, but rather passes between cells through those tight cell junctions to get across that gastrointestinal tract. And what we showed was that the rumen and the omasum, so basically the four gut components are quite tight. So they have a high barrier function or a low permeability. But once we get into the small intestine, and the start of the large intestine in the cecum, we see quite high permeabilities. So this data suggests that the intestine is probably more leaky than the rumen omasum or even the more distal components of the large intestine, suggesting that we probably need to focus on these regions when we're thinking about a leaky gut scenario and maybe not the rumen or the distal colon. Now others have, have started along this line as well. This is some data from Lance Baumgard's group. In this experiment, they exposed dairy cattle to different severities of low feed intake. So ad libitum, 80% of their ad libitum, 60, 40, or 20% of their ad libitum. They had a GLP-2 uh, injection treatment in this study. I'm not gonna focus on that. But what I do wanna highlight is they have provided indicators that exposure to this reduction in feed intake caused a systemic inflammatory response. So they were able to detect higher concentrations of endotoxins, a component of bacterial cell walls in, uh, in the blood of cattle exposed to greater severities of feed restriction. And they also detected higher concentrations of serum amyloid A, a, a uh, acute phase protein, again, 
indicating a systemic immune response and a greater immune response for those animals that were exposed to more severe off-feed uh, events. Now, part of the reason for that, we think, is that those off-feed events are changing nutrient supply for the microbes, causing changes in the microbial structure, probably changes in their release of pro-inflammatory molecules, but also changes in the gut morphology. So in this study, they were able to show that exposure to low feed intake decreases the width of the jejunum villi, decreases the depth of the crypts, and it also did uh, really the same effect in the ileum. So short-term exposure to reduced feed intake and a fairly transient change in feed intake also caused change, changes in the intestinal morphology. So following that, we wanted to know, okay, if we start seeing changes not only in the human but also in the intestine, which region of the gut is probably most affected? And again, we were starting to lead to the suggestion that it's probably intestinal regions and, and not rumen or foregut regions. In this experiment, we used uh, 21 steers. We had them on a control treatment, so no challenge. We exposed them to either rumen acidosis or a transient off-feed exposure uh, for low feed intake. They were all fed the same diet. Uh, and when you look at our experimental program, what we had is basically five days of adaptation so we could measure uh, baseline dry matter intake. We challenged them for or to rumen acidosis by exposing a feed restriction coupled by overfeeding. And we exposed them to low feed intake, so we restricted feed intake to 25% of their voluntary dry matter intake for five days. That exposure to low feed intake reduced body weight. So you can see 250 kilos down to 230 kilos with five days of exposure. A lot of that was probably gut fill, um, but I'll show you there are some other changes that are occurring within the gastrointestinal tract, suggesting we are seeing changes at a visceral level as well. We also did see that reduction in dry matter intake. This should not be surprising uh, as that was the model that was imposed. So when we look at luminal pH, recognizing that if we change feed intake, we're also changing fermentable substrate, probably throughout the gastrointestinal tract. We again see that exposure to low feed intake increased reticulorumen pH, had no effect on pH in the small intestine or even in the proximal uh, large intestine, but once we get into the colon, we can see that there is higher pH, suggesting again less fermentable substrate entering that large intestine where we do have a fairly large microbial colony or colonization and fairly extensive microbial fermentation. We also looked at the concentration of VSA throughout the gastrointestinal tract, showing that that low feed intake, again, reduces VFA concentration in both the rumen and the duodenum. Didn't really expect to see changes in duodenum, but perhaps this could be some VFA flow out of the rumen, even though we would expect that to be very low. Uh, otherwise, no real major changes in short-chain fatty acid concentration uh, throughout the gastrointestinal tract. We did see marked reductions in the absorptive surface area of the rumen. So the length of the papillae, the width of the papillae, the perimeter or the area of the papillae, and then the two-dimensional surface area were all drastically reduced by five days of low feed intake. And when you look at that surface area response, we're seeing over a 50% reduction in two-dimensional surface area caused by a five-day exposure to low feed intake. So I think these off-feed events could have quite pronounced effects. These probably explain why short-chain fatty acid absorption or VFA absorption is reduced across the rumen and further gives support why that low feed intake is a very large risk factor predisposing cattle to rumen acidosis upon refeeding. The other important aspect to consider is this is really a retrogressive adaptation response, which occurs very rapidly. 
you compare that to proliferative adaptation, which requires somewhere between four and eight weeks to achieve maximal surface area. So short-term off-feed events can have a very rapid destructive effect on the absorptive surface area. And based on the available data, it looks like it will take a long time, four to eight weeks for cattle to uh, readapt those uh, papillae to expand their surface area. So in this case, rather than measuring barrier function in vivo, so in the animal, we wanted to evaluate that barrier function outside of the animal. So this is data using a tissue, tissue culture model. So we basically excised tissues from the animal, kept them outside, outside of the animal, and measured the permeability across those tissues. Now, this allowed us to look at the regional effects, but the problem is we're doing this outside of the animal. So we're ignoring some of those biological effects that are excluded with this model. Interestingly, in this case, we saw that permeability was actually reduced. So the tissues were actually more tight five days after that low feed intake challenge. Now this is completely opposite to what we had shown previously, where that exposure to low feed intake increased permeability of the gut. However, those measurements were conducted on day three relative to the induction of that low feed intake. So not only do we have a model difference, we also have a timing difference of measurements. And this, this is gonna be brought back at the end of this presentation to hopefully highlight what I think is going to happen. We also looked at mannitol flux, so another marker, again, showing the same response. In this case, we could detect reduced permeability in the rumen and reduced permeability in the proximal and distal colon for cattle that were exposed to that low feed intake period. So again, two different markers, both showing the same thing, saying by day five after exposure of low feed intake, there might be some adaptation occurring in the gut to ensure that those cattle are not exposed to uh, chronic inflammation and likely experience uh, sepsis. Supporting those outcomes, we saw that gene expression for genes involved in tight cell junction formation, so clodins, occludins, and zona occludins, were all increased for those cattle that have been exposed to low feed intake, as shown in the blue bars. We also did see upregulation of TLR4. TLR4 is a receptor uh, within the cells that detects a component of, uh, of bacterial cell walls and really is key to induce a pro-inflammatory response. So we're suggesting that, yeah, there might be a pro-inflammatory response occurring as we would expect, but because of that perhaps we are seeing increased expression of those tight cell junctions, which allowed the gut to be less permeable. Not only did we see that in the rumen, we also saw that in the duodenum, and we also saw that in the colon. So again, different regions of the gastrointestinal tract, probably all of them being uh, affected by low feed intake and all seeming to have a uh, positive effect in terms of improving tight cell junction expression and decreasing permeability. So those contradictory studies or outcomes of the studies I showed coupled with other studies we have and other data from the literature have allowed us to put together a model for what we think is happening. So if we first look at dry matter intake, if we have stable dry matter intake, coupled by a rapid and transient off-heat event, uh, we can see a very gradual recovery for dry matter intake. And our data suggests that the severity of that off-heat event will dictate the rate of recovery for that dry matter intake. So those animals that go off-feed to a greater extent will take longer to resume their uh, expected dry matter intake. Now, in response to those changes in dry matter intake, uh, I think our data clearly show that we have a reduction in absorptive capacity. That reduction somewhat lags behind dry matter intake, both in terms of the reduction, but also in terms of the recovery response. 
And I think this makes a lot of sense. If we think that the gastrointestinal tract uh, is a disproportionate user of energy, it makes sense that it decreases more rapidly when cattle are exposed to a reduction in feed intake. This could be a homeostatic mechanism to uh, preserve energy supplies and then gradually adapts to an increasing plane of nutrition or increasing nutrient intake, again, to maintain that homeostatic response. Barrier function seems to have a different response where uh, early on we have fairly high barrier function or low permeability. We think we see a transient reduction followed by an increase in terms of permeability with exposure to low feed intake. And again, I alluded, alluded to this, but I think this is critical. If we would see chronic reductions in barrier function or high permeability, we would have animals that are highly susceptible to sepsis. And so we think that this transient response for increasing barrier function is again a homeostatic mechanism to make sure that the immune system responds appropriately to those microbial challenges and altered uh, or, and alters the permeability to do so. Following recovery, we think we see an over-exaggeration of tight cell junction expression, and I showed you that best in that last experiment, followed by a very gradual decline back to basal functions. Again, maintaining a very high level of uh, barrier function or low permeability could be energetically uh, expensive and probably not needed uh, during non-challenge situations. So with that, I'll bring it uh, to the conclusions. I, I hope I've uh, given you the appreciation that off-feed events or, or very transient reductions in heat intake is probably an underappreciated challenge. Very high predisposing factor for ruminacidosis. We've shown that the gastrointestinal tract responds to that low feed intake by decreasing its surface area, decreasing nutrient absorption. We see at least a transient response for reduction in barrier function. And because of these changes, increased risk for uh, a pro-inflammatory situation. I think where we really need to start focusing on now, and I showed you some data, but we really need to have a better understanding of the factors that can help promote recovery of the gastrointestinal tract following exposure to low feed intake. With that, I'd be happy to uh, address any questions there may be, uh, and thank you for your attention during this presentation. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, that was great. Um, cup, one thing, two things I want to remind the audience of before I switch to the questions, and I have a bunch of questions here keyed up. Keyed up. Um, one is that for those of you who are going to ask for CEU or continuing education credits for either ARPIS or RACE uh, for the veterinarians, you will be getting an email uh, after the webinar uh, that will give you instructions on how to claim those credits. Uh, the other uh, point of information is just to remind you that this is going to, this has been recorded and you will receive a link to that recording with that email uh, from our offices. So that fits in well, that, that webinar, that this presentation fit in very well with, uh, with our, our functions in the field. And there are a couple of questions here that I'd like to address. Let me just unlock this panel. There we go. Okay, so Greg, question number one here for you. Uh, in your feed restriction trials, how have you measured, in addition to chromium, any inflammatory cytokines or acute phase proteins or morbidity differences as a result of the restriction? That's a very good question. So the data I showed you, I did not include any acute phase proteins uh, or any other indicators uh, of inflammation or potential morbidity. 
These are all small scale studies, so we we don't have uh, any true morbidity uh, outcomes. Uh, and unfortunately, in most of the studies, they're terminal, so um, all animals uh, had to be euthanized for, for the context of the study. But when we look at serum amyloid A or haptoglobin or lipopolysaccharide binding protein as indicators of pro-inflammatory responses, uh, these are commonly upregulated. And I also showed you data from uh, another lab, uh, Dr. Lance Baumgard's group, again, showing evidence for uh, a pro-inflammatory or a systemic pro-inflammatory response. So I think those outcomes are clear. Uh, we're currently working on a, a study or hoping to start a study looking at the effect of respiratory disease, and we will have a very clear uh, morbidity and, and mortality assessment uh, in that study. So more data to come. Um, as we currently have it, it pro-inflammatory outcomes from a systemic standpoint are fairly clear. Uh, but our studies have been too small to look at performance or uh, morbidity effects um, from a, a more herd level. Okay, thanks. Uh, next one was more of a getting your opinion rather than just a question. It seemed that on one of the slides, the absorption across the room and wall was more severe uh, during an off the, the feed restriction rather than when you induced acidosis. Is that true? And do you have any comment relative to that? In other words, I think they're asking, so that, is Sarah more, have more an effect on absorption than feed restriction? That's, that's a very, another very good question. I think it, we need to think of these challenges uh, a little bit different way. Um, first of all, I think low feed intake is more likely to have a longer term uh, effect reducing short, -term, uh, short chain fatty acid absorption or VFA absorption. So I, I think if we would evaluate the response, we would see a longer term effect. Rumen acidosis, I think what we are measuring in most cases, and, and I have some data to support this. I didn't show it in the presentation, but it looks like we see a fairly transient reduction in short-chain fatty acid absorption. So the study I'm, I'm thinking about, we induced rumen acidosis. We measured uh, short-chain fatty acid absorption two days after induction, and then we measured it again a week later. And by a week after or nine days after the induction, we had basically complete recovery of short-chain fatty acid absorptive capacity. And so I think what they do, what cattle do, is reduce their absorption of short-chain fatty acids during an acidotic induction event to prevent systemic acidification. So basically to prevent a metabolic acidosis. With a low feed intake period, I showed you data where we have reductions in the absorptive uh, morphology, so the absorptive surface area of the rumen was decreased by 50% or more than 50%. And because that proliferation response is so gradual, we would expect that that effect of low feed intake would be much more long term. I hope, I hope that helps. Um, it, but yeah, it in helps short, me. I think low feed intake will be more dramatic. I'm sure that helps. That helps quite a bit. So just as a follow-up comment from myself, that means that things like, you know, empty feed bunks or overcrowding uh, resulting in very short-term restricted feed intakes could, could have very profound effects on nutrient absorption. That's I, I believe that to be the question. case. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I do believe that to be the case. Um, the challenge is, you know, when we look at an empty feed bunk in the morning or you walk in and you see the feed bunk empty, uh, if it's been empty for four hours or, or five hours, there are probably some cows that have been exposed to 10, 12 hours without feed. Uh, and these are probably presumably, uh, hopefully they're high producing cows, maybe not right now under the current context, but under uh, optimal economic situations, they would be high producing cows or at least fed a highly fermentable diet and exposure to that refeeding would allow for quite rapid microbial growth, 
and we think because of the reduction in papillae surface area, uh, even with 12 hours, probably a greater risk uh, for low rumen pH. So that's something that really needs to be tested. Thanks. Next question. I like this one. From your work, should we reconsider, I guess it, you considered it in the first place, should we reconsider the strategy of limit feeding developing heifers, uh, providing predicted nutrients in a small dry matter intake package um, over a period of time? So limit feeding of heifers would be just concentrating the diet and limiting the, the quantity of intake. Would that not be, or would that cause some of these issues? So I think we need to think about limit feeding and off-feed events as two separate um, categories. So in our studies and, and even uh, the work that Lance Baumgart has done, when we limit feed or we, we expose those cattle to feed restriction, we are not only restricting dry matter intake, but we're also restricting nutrient intake. Uh, and I think there is a difference between dry matter intake reductions and nutrient intake restrictions. So in a programmed feeding or a heifer limit feeding model, they are fed a higher nutrient density diet at a lower quantity to reduce feed requirements and reduce, uh, I guess, nutrient export or fecal output. I think that is completely different, and I would anticipate that if we would use that in an experimental model, we probably would not be able to detect differences between ad libitum fed animals. Okay, thank you. Next question, uh, are there specific nutrients or fractions of nutrients that could be used during known off-feed events, or I guess that also means if we know an off-feed event is about to happen, um, to address this uh, reduced absorption function? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I didn't put the data in. We have a pilot study uh, that's been completed where we were looking at uh, feed additives in a cocktail uh, format. So in this case, we had sodium butyrate. Um, butyrate obviously has or induces quite strong proliferative effects on the gut. It's also been shown in many different models to enhance tight cell junction uh, expression and assembly. We also had uh, antioxidants in this experiment uh, and we had rumen protected betaine. So a product that's not commercially available, but because betaine's role as a, a methyl donor uh, and its role as an osmotic protector we thought it could have a beneficial effect. Now there's a lot of noise in this study. It was designed as a pilot study, so it can't answer all the questions that, that we have, but there was good evidence that providing that cocktail group of feed additives did accelerate uh, the recovery for short chain fatty acid absorption. So the short story of the long answer is I think there are possibilities um, understanding what functional ingredients are needed to be able to help protect the gut or accelerate recovery, uh, I think requires a lot of work. And in my opinion, I think the acceleration of recovery is probably the model uh, that should be focused on simply because we, we often don't know when these off-feed events will occur. We might get a day or, or two days lead time in terms of a heat stress event. But if you think of infectious disease or transition disorders, yeah, you know the cow's about to calve, but you don't know if she's going to have metritis or mastitis or, or other events that, that can cause her to go off feed. Great, thank you. Now, a rather long question here. A high percentage of large dairy operations have a high number of heifers uh, that they're breeding artificially. In order to get good lockup, they are restricted feed intake to a point where the heifers are out of feed for around 12 hours. They notice a decrease in each subsequent insemination. Could you comment on the effect of limit feed situation and possible effects on reproduction? Wow, that's getting a long way from, from and, and, and what I would consider me, myself. Then give me world peace. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's getting a long way from what I would consider myself to be an expert in. But okay. I, I've seen some recent papers. Um, now, this isn't on the cow side, but showing uh, a change in uh, semen quality after exposure to rumen acidosis. Now, I don't think this is a rumen effect. I think it's probably related to systemic pro-inflammatory responses, which are kind of well characterized in rumen acidosis induction studies. And with a, let's say, 12-hour feed withdrawal period, I would not be surprised if uh, there really is a practical applied rumen acidosis induction model. So my, my lead suggestion would be whether or not that practice would be inducing rumen acidosis, and then there would have to be some relevant linkage between rumen acidosis or systemic pro-inflammatory responses on, uh, I guess, uh, fertilization uh, or implantation uh, rates. But that's getting a little far out from, from what I feel comfortable commenting on. Sorry about okay. that. No, that's 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 very legitimate. Um, how can one apply this model to transition cows? Specific reference to reduced feed intake prior to calving, and then getting them off to the best start. Yeah, so this is an area that, that we're trying to pursue if if we can get some funding. Um, but what we're proposing is a fairly short-term feeding of a high forage diet. Now, practically, this becomes a little bit difficult and it's really farm specific. In some cases, you may be able to deal with this in a maternity pen. Uh, in other cases, if you have a, uh, a small fresh pen or a short-term fresh pen, may be able to provide a higher forage diet or lower fermentable diet for a very short period of time, I'm thinking two to three days to allow for adequate rumen fill, and then uh, fairly abruptly transition them to uh, a more conventional fresh or uh, high, high producing uh, or peak lactation diet. Now, the reason I, I think we can do this uh, is we have some studies evaluating the rate of adaptation or cattle that are not in a nutritional challenge. So simply changing the forage to concentrate ratio in the diet. And we've shown quite clearly that if dry matter intake is high, you can have fairly abrupt changes in diet fermentability without causing major uh, disruption to that uh, rumen environment. And so what we think, or what the running hypothesis is, is that if we have adequate rumen fill in these early postpartum cows or heifers, that they'll be able to better transition and tolerate a rapid increase in diet fermentability following calving. So it's still fairly theoretical. Um, the application really is limited based on uh, individual farm settings and, and the management imposed. I, I agree there are some logistical concerns uh, but I think if we can clearly identify whether this process has biological effects, uh, the nutritionists and the producers are far smarter than I am, and they'll figure out how to implement it on farm. Thank you. Um, here's a very pointed and, I guess, a situation that is existing for this particular person. Some dairy operations do not have dry forages for young heifers, and it's more common to see diarrhea in these heifers that are fed fermented feeds, especially when they're less than five months of age. Uh, do you feel that this is strictly due to lower rumen pH and acidosis, or is there any other way to reduce the diarrhea in this type of feeding management when only fermented feeds are available? I'm, I'm going to have to defer realm. that question. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to defer that question. I think we'd really need to sit down and look at, you know, what yeah, what do the the silages or fermented feeds look like? What is feed intake? Um, I'm sorry for, no, I guess, I, avoiding that question, it's but a little, it's a little outside of the the topic. Um, 
but everybody has an opinion, so you. <laughs> yeah. Um, question specific to one of the trials that you showed in the treatments where the dry matter intake reduction is 25 percent the response was somewhat modest as compared to the severe re feed restriction of 50 percent uh, in real world applications i presume that under most management situations feed restrictions of greater than 50 percent are very rare um, and probably already secondary to some other problem uh, is the issue then really a significant concern when under normal management so so i think that's a, a good question that puts how we think about the results in, into context um, i agree under i would say normal heat stress scenarios 25 percent of their voluntary intake is probably a bit excessive I doubt they would be exposed to that severe of feed restriction. However, if you look at other disorders, uh, and, and again, this puts it into the context of maybe not normal management, but um, you know, BBD, for example, has been shown to drop dry matter intake by about 80%. Uh, so 20% of their voluntary feed intake. Uh, cows with metritis or mastitis often drop dry matter intake uh, at least 50%, if not more. Uh, and so while this might not be normal management, I think it gives us some insight in terms of how we might be, or how we maybe could be thinking about some of these higher, uh, higher risk cattle or these cattle that are more sensitive to nutritional uh, disruption simply because of the primary cause that's driving that reduction in feed intake. And so if we're trying to help uh, recover those cattle, not only to their primary uh, disorder, but also the secondary disorder that's caused by the low feed intake, we may be able to develop new strategies to help them recover faster or experience less distress while recovering. Thank you. There's one more question here. I think the, uh, well, I'll ask it. Uh, should we investigate and update our ration software, uh, I guess the models, as options to include when we know feed in restrictions are going to happen as far as nutrient absorption is concerned? And that includes, I, I guess that would be like, uh, I'm just thinking of an example of feed intake restriction due to heat stress. Should we be during heat stress period be changing our expected dry matter intake and nutrient absorption coefficients? So I think the models already account for environmental stresses. Um, you can argue how sensitive they are, but um, they do account for environmental stresses on feed intake. I'm, because of where I am, I'm more familiar with the cold stress side of the models than I am familiar with the heat stress side, but I think they're accounted for uh, in in the well, I know they're accounted for in the NRC model or NASA model, uh, and I think they're accounted for in the CNCPS model. Um, if we focus on the CNCPS model right now, they are not predicting metabolizable energy supply from VFA absorption. Right. So changes in VFA absorption are not likely to change ME supply given how the model functions. Uh, so. Uh, that type of change would require a complete rework of the model uh, and there is not sufficient data available to allow for such a, a rework. Agreed. Okay, well that pretty much wraps up all the questions we received. Obviously you've generated some interest there and some thought. Um, Again, everybody, we're, you're going to be receiving a link to the recorded webinar and a link to your continuing education credits. I want to thank everybody for attending, and I want to thank especially Greg for taking time out of his isolation to present this to us. Um, in, so isolation. I wish, <laughs> in isolation. In <laughs> isolation. I wish you all a, a very good day and stay safe. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone.